see everyone. It's been a while, and uh, a lot has been going on in the Porter family. And I'm here to declare that the gospel is true. Amen. Jesus is still who he says he is, and his grace is wonderful. My brother dealt with a melanoma cancer quite serious for 33 months. April 15, he went to heaven. Uh, he was five years younger than I am. Uh, he was 70. And we were very close. Our father died when we were quite young. He was 11. I was 15. The day my mother's, the, my father's funeral, my mother had the three of us kneel down in her bedroom. Uh, at that point, we were Lutheran, and uh, my mother for sure was a God-fearer. Uh, anyway, she prayed, and she said, uh, God, I, she was 40, my dad was 42, I don't know what we're going to do. And these children have lost their father. I ask you to be their father. Take care of them. I entrust them into your hands. Now, she wouldn't know 2 Timothy 1 at this point, where God guards what's entrusted to him. You have no idea how my brother and I tried to break that prayer. But that day, an anchor was set. That went to the very holy of holies in heaven itself. And the anchor was a silver thread of grace. And I remember one time asking my brother, when did you get saved? He said, well, I was eight years old. I said, really? You're kidding. He said, no, uh, I was watching Billy Graham on TV with Grandma Seelan. That was my mother's mother. And Billy gave the altar call, and we got on our knees. She was crying, I was crying, and I really asked Jesus into my heart. I was serious. I said, whoa, we did go on a detour from that day. And from 11 years old to the age of 27, you have no idea, my brother, uh, I was a mess, but he was a real mess. And uh, he was a fighter. He was unbelievably strong for his size. People would come from all around the UP to fight Tom Porter. I couldn't believe he was that small. But he was also a wrestler. And when he drank, he got mean. And uh, he just pummeled guys. And then at after about a four-month drunk, he went to the hospital for a weekend to dry out. He went into convulsions, got afraid. This was February 1979. He had been calling me over the years different times, 3 o'clock in the morning. You don't love me anymore. <laughs> I would listen to the nonsense as long as I could, hang up, go back to bed. But then, can I come? And so he came. Came to Cloquet and for a week. And we had an outpouring meeting on Friday nights, and people were getting really encountered by the Lord. And he got delivered of so many demons. He got filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. People started prophesying over him. And he never looked back. He never went back to Michigan. And then a few months later, he says, You know, I think the Lord wants me to marry Sidney Langenbrenner. I says, You've got to be kidding me. You just dried out, and you think, that's my youth group. She was pure as the driven snow. Really? Boy, I don't know. You've been telling us about hearing God. I think I, I think I, that's what he's thinking. I said, well, we'll see. And uh, a year later, in April, I married him. Uh, they proceeded to have nine children, 29 grandchildren. In the 33-month trial of his life that ended with his death. In the middle of that was his beloved Anna, a twin, who died. My sister-in-law is a testimony for the body of Christ. She is an absolute rock. She is pure. She is worshiping God with all her heart. She is standing firm right now. As we speak, she would be worshiping the Lord. She's not bitter. She's hurting beyond hurting. 
Last Sunday when I was in the church, how are you doing, Cindy? She said, it hurts. Uh, it's painful. Well, last Friday, Kitty and I were at Costco, and I ran into a brother I hadn't seen for I don't know how long. Somebody wanted to taste, watch the little girl here so we don't get unnecessarily distracted. Uh, oh. uh, she's cute, and I get it, uh, but I also need to share something. I praise the Lord. Um, Helmer Heckel, he's from Germany, he's a pastor forever. He's about 80 years old, wonderful man of God. He said, God gave me a gift a few years ago. I began to write poetry. Really? He says, yeah, I got a... I, 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 I got him hooked up with the publisher I'm working with from my book on Paul. He sent us six poems on grief. When my brother died, I went through a stretch there with my heart. It was kind of crazy. It was out of rhythm. and I've had that for years, but this was unusual. Cardio version a couple of times. Then they were going to do an ablation. and They did the ablation. And then a week later, it still went out. That's crazy. And uh, and then I went in for another cardio version. It was out again, and that day when they do the check before, it was good to go. And I had, I've been in rhythm ever since. My wife said, honey, you're dealing with some grief regarding your brother. You know, we were in the same bed for 10 years growing up. I would tell my time, stop breathing. Because he was kind of semi-snoring, I said, he said, well, he had a wonderful sense of humor. What am I supposed to do, hold my breath till morning? <laughs> and Helmer, I, I, I really felt to read this. This is not my message, but I felt to read this. Love and grief. Life is like a coin, round and smooth, round to depict forever and smooth to show its use. But a coin has another quality, as all things claim. It has two sides, one for love and joy, and another for loss and pain. We enjoy the one side of life. We frolic and run and never are done. We make merry, glad, and happy, rolled all into one. The other side we seldom behold, and never want to see the pain, the death, the hurt, and the sorrow for you and me. But as the coin rolls on through the valleys and hills, its bumpy ride takes curves and spills. And as it falls, we see to our horror and dismay the other side where there is pain, death, and decay. Oh, no, that cannot be that we have to face adversity. This is a mistake. This is not right. I am not ready to lose my sanity. We hope, we bargain, we deny our pain. We attempt to turn the coin, but all is in vain. Grief is the other side of love. And loss is the other side of gain. That is the logic of life. It is clear and plain. It's like a beautiful rose with sweet aroma, but sharp thorns. Or like the gentle breeze and tornadoes, that mighty roars. Love and grief are two peas in a pod. Each of us will hold, we will each hold, eat, and digest both a lot. The sooner we can make peace with this other side, the better we fare and the sweeter our ride. There is no logic that can say there is no death, no pain, and no hurt along the way. This is not yet heaven where we live and not die. This is a fallen world with sin, death, shame, and evil under the sky. So let laughter, gladness, and joy fill the air. Let life spring forth and the good times roll, but beware. There is always and will always, as long as fall changes leaves, the logic of two sides of the coin, love and grief. I said, Homer, that's really good. And, and so here's where we are. Uh, the poor family is following Christ, loving Christ, all in with Christ. 
Questions? I, after 50 years, I got more questions than answers. And I've come to this simple conclusion. The kingdom is two things. Revelation, where we see. Mystery, where we don't see. And during the times of mystery, in particular, that is when our faith is proven sure. Solid. It's not fraudulent. Uh, two weeks, or not, a few weeks ago, two movies opened on the same weekend. Sovereignty of God is always at work, and so you have to, Jesus actually kind of rebuked when you look at the signs and you're not getting it, and then you expect to understand when I'm coming back, Barbie and Oppenheimer open on the same weekend. Fraudulent, false, outward, Barbie world. That is in many ways a statement of the American culture. And Oppenheimer, about the atomic bomb being formed that will eventually bring end to World War II. Can you see it? I mean, when you read 2 Peter chapter 3, he is actually describing something that appears to be atomic. The melting of elements. Suddenly. So we are in a real, wow. And I'm not saying we, we obviously we're not going to live in Barbie land, and we're not going to be in fear and death, but we have to understand we in, are in a culture. Now, right before that, to Hollywood's shock, the number one movie in America was what? Sound of Freedom. Have you seen it? Yes. Okay. What is God saying through that? Well, obviously, he's beginning to expose. If you read the message by the actor at the end of the movie, which was very good, five years, Hollywood stop that movie from being shown. Why? Because at the very highest levels of Hollywood, pedophilia is a is a almost epidemic. So here we are. In a very fragile, false Barbie land. And yet you and I are part of a kingdom that is the antithesis. It's a rock that cannot be moved, and the anchor holds. And when I preached my brother's funeral a week later, the church was packed. Uh, Corda's very well-known name in Cambridge, nine children, 29 grandchildren. Uh, the anchor holds. The anchor's going to hold for your life. And some of your children right now that may be struggling, with, but we're uh, dedicated to God. The anchor holds. And amen. I want to share briefly. Don't lie to us, Chuck. I'm actually going to set my timer. I've come to this simple conclusion. Um, sometimes we get so into searching out something and the answer is right in front of you, about as plain as it can be to see and read. And uh, uh, right now across America there are churches by the hundreds, thousands, who knows how many, that are trying to come up with a vision. What are we all about? What's our vision? And I, I'm telling you, they have all day think tanks. They get the blackboard out, they start writing down concepts, and people start throwing out ideas. And what's our vision? What's our mission statement? And we wrestle and we struggle. Can I give you the absolute premier vision for every local church in America? Seems like it's a bold statement, right? It's, did our guy pass out there? No. What are you doing? Lying. Say again? It was lying. 
You, you're resting? Yeah. Okay, I'll have, have sit up. You've got to listen to this. <laughs> Praise God. I'm not going to let you take a nap on me. Hey, Garrett, thank you for doing the sound. Did you have a long night? Yeah. I hear you. It'll help you if you want to sit right here. <laughs> Amen. If I'm not anointed enough to keep you awake, have a good man. Okay? Fair enough. Lord, help me right now in Jesus' name. Help me right now, Lord. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. I didn't give you these scriptures, Garrett. I don't know if you can spontaneously quickly bring them, bring it up. Acts 11, verse 19. It's the story of Antioch. And, and I'm beginning to realize that God has a vision for every local church rooted and grounded in Antioch. Now, why is this important? It's because it's, it's the church of grace. It's the church of the full new covenant. It's the church where they were first called Christians. So let's start with verse 11, uh, excuse me, verse 19 at Antioch. So then there arose who were scattered because of the persecution that arose in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. People are scattered because of persecution. The church has always flourished in atmospheres of persecution. This is historically proven true. China's in the greatest move of God in the history of the church under severe persecution. And so Stephen's death was brutal. It was a brutal stoning. He was the first martyr. He saw the glory. He forgave those who stoned him, depicting Calvary at work. And Paul and his persecutors just brought it to a whole other level because they were threatened by what that young man represented. And so they are scattered. In fact, the Bible says the Jerusalem church, which was of thousands, was totally empty. The only ones that were left were the apostles. We're talking thousands scattered, okay? And they make their way to Antioch, about 450 miles north of Jerusalem. And when they get there, Somebody has the revelation, we don't know who, but somebody begins to see, hey, this is not just for Jews. This is also for Greeks. Now this is a crucial step, because that means the doors are wide open after Calvary for whosoever. And there was no greater division in that time than Jew and Gentile. If Gentiles were to try to go into the temple, stoning could happen. They, they could take you out. They could have you arrested. There was, it was, there was a partition, okay? It was a wall that kept them divided. It was literally the law of Moses that kept them divided. But somebody had the revelation similar to Stephen, by the way. We don't have time to, did I start my timer? Somebody say, start your timer if you didn't. Praise God, I didn't. That's, that's on me. I, I'll just take five minutes. What good does it do to have a timer if you don't start it? It doesn't even make sense. Does it? Praise God. Looks all till the water dries up. Antioch. Okay, so they come to Antioch, and somebody has this revelation. Hey, I feel like the, the gospel needs to reach Gentiles. And the hand of God is immediately confirming that revelation. And hundreds and hundreds are being saved. It's a mighty move of the Spirit that's taking place in Antioch. And, and somehow, without an apostle there, this, these new saved believers, Jew and Gentile, begin to kind of formed together into a local expression that we know as a local church, a local body of Christ. And so the Jerusalem church, which still felt they were boss, sent Barnabas to go check it out. 
Barnabas was a seasoned guy, he was a veteran, and, and so let's look at verse, I think it's 20, uh, I gotta just my old where is it? Uh, verse 23, verse 22, and the news about them reached the ears of Jerusalem church, they sent Barnabas off to Antioch, that when he had come and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. That's the phrase. And when he saw the grace of God at work, the grace of God is a force, it's a power. The grace of God is God's divine ability to do what only God can do. Praise God. Keep working it down there, our Garrett. You got verse 23? What book are you what book are you using? What version? Yes. Uh, Paul's version. King James? No. <laughs> New American Standard. New American Standard. Uh, if that's available, praise God. Uh, so one day I'm reading Acts eleven twenty three. How many of you have had a Bible verse jump up and grab your heart? You've had it. Grab my heart. And I ask this question. When you look at a Bible verse, when you look at a portion of scripture that you don't fully kind of get it right away, ask questions. Now the only issue about asking questions is you have to be willing to get the answer. Ask questions. So I said, Lord, what did he see? What did he see? I'm telling you in about 20 seconds. Now you're going to have to trust me on this. I hope that doesn't sound like your local used car salesman, but you're going to have to trust me on this. It's kind of subjective. I get it. Five 316s exploded in my spirit. Now I'm not going to spawn them. I'm just going to give them to you for you to chew on. You can go ahead and share it. Uh, with, with your pastor David when he comes back, but I'm submitting to this. I felt like the Lord said, you need to bring forth today in the body of Christ the vision of Antioch and say it unashamedly, it's the premier vision for every local church. I may end up getting criticized and rebuked. That's all right. Not the first time. Five three sixteens. Here they are if you write them down. John three sixteen. John three sixteen. Number two. Luke three sixteen. Number three. Acts three sixteen. Number four. Joel three sixteen. Number five, Exodus. Three, sixteen. Did you get them all written down? Uh, Gary, you don't, I don't know how quick you can do that Bible thing there. Um, what well, verse do you need? But let's let's just leave those five, three, sixteens where they're at. Okay, uh, let, let me just comment a few, a, a few on number one. Number one is John three, sixteen. Everybody that's truly saved knows of John three, sixteen. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me love him. He saw the love of the Father. You know, my brother was 11 years old when his father died. Now, we had a large Italian family. We had uncles that were really good, but they're not fathers. And for him to become the father he became without a template is a sheer manifestation of the grace of God. You know, four of his daughters shared at his uh, at the funeral. She said, "You know, every each, we all thought individually we were my dad's favorite. We're not kidding. No, we're not just saying that. We felt we were." His favorite. Do you realize that's a gift? And 
Do you know what it means prophetically? Because you're in the begotten, the first begotten, because you are in Christ, you are the Father's favorite. Can you see it? I believe. You're in the only begotten, Jesus Christ. The Father's love. Preach on the Father's love. You can spend a month just talking about Father. The Father who adopts. The Father who chooses. The Father who is pictured in the story, uh, prodigal, w waiting for the prodigal to come home with a heart open wide of compassion. Throughout scriptures, and then Jesus culminates it at the end of his ministry, if you see me, you see the Father. He was the exact representation, replica, substance of his father. That's, that's the uniqueness and the importance of the incarnation. The father so loved that he gave. Antioch was a giving church. You know, Jerusalem never got out of famine. Antioch was into giving. It gave their best in the first missionary church, Paul and Apostle uh, Barnabas. It gave a relief fund for the Jerusalem church, took a love offering. It was always giving, because it was always in a flow. It was always in a supply. The grace of God was like a river flowing in Antioch. Acts 3.16. So we see at the end of chapter 11, the very last verse, uh, they take this love offering for the Jerusalem church, and Barnabas and Paul, go down to Jerusalem. Now I want you to get this. It's a 450 mile walk. That means it took them about six weeks to get there. And so if you're walking with someone for six weeks, spending the night, walking in the day, how many would agree with me that you're going to get to know one another a little bit deeper? You're going to begin to share heart. You're going to begin to share what's going on in your life. Wow. Do you think you can begin to get knit together, kindred spirit? Of course. And then they're there the entire chapter 12. They're there the entire chapter 12 in Jerusalem while, according to Helmer's poem, two sides of the coin play out. James is beheaded brutally. And Peter is delivered. One of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. Both are married. Both are apostles. Both very likely have children. Young children, because they're young themselves in the 30s. Uh, and, and so there it is. James, there's a widow. Peter's wife, there's delivered. And Peter comes to the shock of the whole church, totally delivered, joins the prayer meeting, and this joy erupts. Paul and Barnabas are in the room. And then everybody gets quiet as this widow with her two children come walking. What do you tell James' his wife? Well, he just didn't have enough faith. Sorry about your fear. I would give that lie in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I have people all over the world praying for my brother. We medically searched out things as best we could medically. We absolutely bombarded heaven with prayer. It was not for lack of prayer. It all of a sudden got swept up into the mysterious, eternal, sovereign plan of God, and I'm in rest about it. I call him every day, sometimes twice, oh, I miss that. He was my best friend, my best man at my wedding, oh, I miss him. I can't you. I'm sorry, 
Paul and Barnabas watch this dynamic play out in the Jerusalem church of James and Peter. Now they're walking back to Antioch, 450 miles, six weeks again. And all of a sudden they get caught up evidently in one night of worship and they begin to press into the heart of God and something in Paul has to share with Barnabas and something in Barnabas has to share with Paul. You know, I got this, I got this something that we need to go. Something inside of me wants to go. Antioch is fabulous. I love it. And here now, I want you to get this, please. You don't get anything else in this message. This is why I'm so convinced right now that that this is the word of the Lord for the body of Christ right now. Antioch was Paul's first experience of real church life. He tasted it. He lived it. He felt it. He got himself totally wrapped up flowing in that grace, that river of grace. And also, he brought with him revelation. He was eight years in hiding. He got caught up to the third heaven. He saw things nobody's ever seen. It was visions and revelations of the Lord. And he, he confirmed what they began to see, and he locked it in. Yes, Calvary unlocked the new covenant. Calvary put an end to the Old Covenant. Calvary abolished the law. This is all radical stuff. This is quite revolutionary. Calvary obliterated your, the document of accusation against each and every one of us, which said to each and every one of us, you're guilty, you're a sinner, and here's the list of sins you did. We got it all here. Prosecuting an attorney from hell. That certificate was nailed on the cross. The law was nailed on the cross. Hallelujah. You were on that cross dying that day. And oh, what an unbelievable eternal work Calvary secured. All sealed. Why am I so fired up? Just relax, Chuck. <laughs> the blood of Jesus sealed it all. If you can break that seal, So they walked back and they saw, let's go, hey, let's do this, don't tell anybody. Let's keep it between us and the Lord and see what he will do. Acts 13, that's where you pick up the story now, verse 1, let it go my man Garrett. Acts 13, verse 1, here it is. There were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers. That is a true church. It's not a church word only. It's not a church spirit only. It's a church in beautiful balance of word and spirit. It has fire it has a fireplace. It has an explosive spontaneity. It also has a divine order. What a church. And there were five guys there that were the leadership team. Barnabas at this point seems to be the lead guy along with these interesting characters. Simeon was a black man from Africa, probably the guy that carried the cross and help Jesus to the cross. Menean grew up a good friend with Herod. He was, in his unsaved days, trained in the Roman ways. He had a lot of money. He came from a wealthy background. Menean was a good friend of Herod. You have Lucius of Cyrene. Lucius is another name for Luke. That's what many believe. Well, not everyone believes, but I tend to lean that way. This is Luke. And, and, and you have Barnabas and you have Paul. Now what happened was, 
When Barnabas comes to Antioch and sees this one, he sees these three other guys. But he says, you know, there's still someone that needs to be added to the mix. And all of a sudden, the Lord brought to Brother Encourager, go find him. Go find him. Eight years, scripturally anyway, in a hidden life. Paul got beat three times in the Jewish synagogue. His back was a mess. Paul was not being an apostle at that time. He's on border discouragement big time. And in 43 AD, he gets caught up and has a vision and sees things which no man has ever seen. And he saw, as I said earlier, the new covenant. He saw the fullness. Wow. Calvary gave humanity a reset. Calvary unleashed a new creation. This is not an appendage to Judaism. This is a brand new ball game in which you are a new creation as you come into Christ. And you are a new species. And it's a new creation following the last Adam. It's, a, you know, it's all awesome stuff. And Barnabas says, where is he? And, and, and the, the precise wording there in verse 24, 25, you don't have to go back to it. It says, and when he found him, F.F. Bruce says, the Greek there is, he was really hard to find. It took him a while to find it, but he was persistent. That's happening right now, by the way, already in the body of Christ. Good friend of mine, Steve Fado, part of my Zoom call on Thursday afternoon, he just got connected with Gene Edwards, right-hand man, who has basically been off the shelf for 30 years. And Fado said, I heard that man speak and brought one of the most unbelievable sermons I've ever heard in my life. And he's been in Atlanta running a clothing business hidden quietly for 30 years. And what's going to happen right now, there are many who have been hidden who are going to emerge. That's why you're all invited. September 28, 9, and 30, we're doing a, a, a plumb line summit on worship. Write this down. You can look it up and you can get all the information you need. Just write plumb line ministry, plumb line ministry, all one word, plumblineministry.com. That'll take you to a website, click on it, and then it'll say learn more, learn more, and then you can register for free, no charge, and it's good. We got people already signing up all over the country. We're going to probably have too many people for the size of the building, but I don't care. Normally this is for leaders only. We're opening it up to the church, so you're welcome to come. It'll be well worth the drive, trust me. Five wonderful guys, prophets and teachers. Look at verse 2. While they were ministering to the Lord, that's worship. It's a worshiping church. It had pure worship, true worship. Worship that touches the hand of Jesus and releases virtue. Later on, Paul will have so many episodes in his life where he thought he was going to die and he had to be entered into when you're in the greatest trial of your life, the only safe place you can go is worship. When my wife gets the report, cancer, 13 years ago, we went home. She got on her knees. I went for a quick errand. I came back. The house was filled with the presence of God. She had worship music on. And it was no more complicated than a daughter of the king, a daughter of the father, touching the hem of his garment with worship. Tears flowing her down her face. Worship. The only safe place on planet Earth right now is worship. In the heart of Christ. While they were ministering to the Lord. They weren't expecting anything. They were just ministering to the Lord. Bam! Some prophet unleashed the word. Set apart! Paul, 
and Barnabas to the work for which I have called them. There it is. Confirmation. But look at what they do. This is where you got to love it. Then when they had fasted and prayed. Now there's the teacher or the word aspect. They're going to <coughs> test that word. They're not going to just swallow it, hook, light, and sinker. They're going to fast and they're going to pray and they're going to say, was that God speaking? Was that really the Lord? Yes. And so what begins then in verse 4 of Acts 13? From the Antioch Church of New Covenant, New Grace, that's the message God wants released to the nations. Not Jerusalem, because it was a mixed bag of law and grace. The Antioch Church. It's unleashed, and Paul will rock two continents. He will end up in Rome itself at the end of that extended, if you will, apostolic journey for the ages. It's all about Antioch. It was Paul's first experience. So Paul had burned into his spirit the pattern, the method of Antioch. That's why he says in his other epistles, as I teach in every church, remind them, Timothy, of my ways as I do in every church. He never varied from it because it was so effective. Now, can that happen? What's the name of this church? Short-term memory. <laughs> living way. New life. Living, new life. I'll be in living, so, okay. I was just a living way. All right, I get it. You know, but come on, help me. How many of you have had short-term memory? A little bit here in, in the last few months. <laughs> Don't lie. I can remember things when I was 10 that I can't remember yesterday. Now, Garrett, that's not a good thing for you to raise your hand at, at your age. <laughs> but I get it. I, I get it. What I really get frustrated is I leave the kitchen and I'm halfway down the hall and I forgot why I was going to the bedroom. Am I talking to the choir here? Oh, yeah. It's so refreshing. And I'm not going to say this to my embarrassment as I'm driving here from Bowen, I start recounting elders I've known for a lot of years, and I came to one of the elders, and I couldn't remember his name. Lord Jesus, that word, I'm going to tell you which one. <laughs> was it Bob? Was it Brian? Was it Steve? Was it Ben? So. Oh, I'm so grateful when all of a sudden, as I'm getting close to the church, oh yes! I got it. Why do I It's always been too easy to speak, too comfortable to speak. It's like sitting in a recliner that was supposed to be alone. Five, three, sixteen, you got it? It was a church filled with love. Three, sixteen, and we will just do it. Two minutes, because I'm going to submit this now to David, to the leaders. I know you got this thing scheduled out. I'm not sure how long he's on sabbatical. I know I'm scheduled back there. How long is he on the Until October 31st. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to hold his feet to the fire. You better be hearing God, brother. <laughs> uh, whoever is whoever is going to be speaking among you, speakers, consider tackling one of these three sixteen. Um, right now, this Sunday morning, I laid this groundwork last Sunday in Grace Gospel Church, my brother's church. And this morning, a young man, we got a team of guys that are bringing the word. He's speaking on number one this morning. That's, it, it's that important. Look for 16, come on. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They all spoke in tongues. Many of them, if not most of them, prophesied. They knew how to move in the Spirit. They knew how to worship. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It's a pure church. It dealt with sin quickly. Didn't play games. Didn't play games. Like so many churches in America. So now you end up with this, with this disaster that 
Now you've got a, a church claiming to be Bible-based, and we love the gospel, and we're even charismatic, but the problem is the pastor is the pastor, and his wife is a him. How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, you've opened the door to cultural lie. You've opened the door to cultural identity deception. So now let the kids make up their mind. Who do you want to be? What do you want to be? It's all a shaking of the fist in the face of God Almighty. The divine order of creation, I'm sorry, is foundationally declared male and female he made them. That's God's plan. Well, what do I do with all this other stuff? You can get freedom in Christ. Amen. Amen. Right now, I can take you to a website that will show you thousands of ex-homosexuals following Christ all over. Totally. Totally. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. Acts 3.16 is, and in the name of Jesus, the power of God hit that guy, blind, uh, a cripple from birth, and they had miraculous things happen in that church. Cry out for it. Cry out for it. In the name of Jesus. Understand the power of that name. Do we realize and do we all agree there is no other name yeah. under heaven by which you can be saved? There is no other name that can get you access to God. The name of Jesus. Uh, also in Acts 3, in the neighborhood of Acts 3, 16, you'll find it's a church of presence. And Peter says, and refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. Isn't it good to be in a place where the manifest presence of God shows up? You know what that refreshing is? It's like a cool breeze. It's like a cool drink of water for someone who's thirsty and has just been in a dry time. Acts 3.16, that's all about Moses. That's all about the burning bush. That's all about a manifestation of the God of the second chance. That is, go to the world, Moses. Go to Egypt and save a nation. And that's a local church that has outreach. That's a local church that wants to advance the kingdom. That's a local church where it says, and they were being added daily, and they were multiplied. So we can say, well, we're strong in this, we're weak in this. Don't get discouraged. Don't get condemned. Just let it be what it is, a total grace standard. And by... Grace will walk into it. So I submit that to you. And by the way, uh, it's not just a local church corporately. You as an individual can be an Antioch believer. You as an individual can be locked into the love of God. You can be spirit filled. You can be the way of God for the power released in the name of Jesus. You can be one who is a Joel 316. I'm sorry, is poor. It's, it's the lion roars in Judah. It's all prophetic. It's all releasing the word of the Lord. Also, you may all prophesy. Is he going to let that out? Did you say Joel? Joel. J O E L. Good job. One. The lion roars in Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The voice of God. That's what you heard in Acts 13 4. The voice of the lion. Released all around us. It, it, it was clear. It was like a roar. It was a distinct sound, a, a trumpet blast. Um, Acts 3 
brother, oh, by the way, is with his mother, his father, his beloved Anna. They had a number of uh, miscarriages. They named everyone. He's meeting children for the first time. It's all good. Tom's fine. Father, seal this to our hearts. Lord, I, and I lift up these precious believers here in Baldwin, Wisconsin. Lord, may we be an Antioch Christian. They were first called Christian. Lord, would you open our eyes to see them covenant like they were before. That we are your favorite. the anchor holes. And there comes a time when heaven calls helps. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just look up that love. I had no idea parenting adult children would be such a challenge. Oh, Jesus. Can't spank them, right? Can't take the keys away. They have their own car, they have their own set of keys. But don't ever discount.